Hello everyone, today we talk about the Ostrogoths. So yeah, finally we come back on the series on the Migration Era peoples and today I thought to give it a shot to the Ostrogoths. It's gonna be very uh, concise given the potential that this topic presents because we can't make it the whole history of the Ostrogoths in their, you know, from the, the, the origins, the, 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 the migration the kingdom in, in the Ukraine, then the passage in, in to Illyria, uh, the kingdom of Italy, uh, the the Gothic Wars, etc. So today we will, of course, try to do that, um, but concisely, not in detail, yet still with a certain amount of you know of of information, and and this is a people that I totally love uh, that is mm, overlooked. Right, because looking at the history of these people, subjectively, we, we got to admit we know a few, a relatively few, and um, it, it's um, it's not easy to to talk about their history um, in in a quite d definitive way. Of course, we we know a lot of things about them, but um, what um, their origins were, the, their development, sometimes is is hidden in the sources. We don't. We don't know much. Uh, when it comes to the migration era, um, we we naturally have to think that um, archaeology is of extreme importance, and we can still find a lot uh, about these populations. But that without historiography and without ancient historiography, we can't fundamentally know much precisely about them. Uh, archaeological evidence is not tagged. We don't know uh, what these peoples were most of the times we, to whom we can attribute certain evidence and it's sometimes frustrating but at the same time this is an, um, an invitation let's say to, to take more seriously historiography that there is this mentality for which ah, if this is not a hard fact like if it is not I don't know a solid evidence we can't talk about you know we can't take seriously historiography historiography is very very important and basically the history of the migration era without the current the contemporary historiography of the time is basically meaningless. We wouldn't know anything about these people, peoples. We would know that, of course, there was someone there that had a certain material culture, was also basically homogeneous to, to, to the one of the surroundings. So it's very difficult to trace movements uh, to to be, um, you know, so we, we should be able to look at it complexively. And also with the humility of who, of who doesn't know, right? And and with the Ostrogoths, I'm making this premise because the Ostrogoths are objectively some of, of the uh, l um, more, um, uh, I can't say just, I can't say complicated, but say complex, complex peoples to frame a, as a unique entity. Um, they have an incredibly interesting history that now we'll look at. Um, but also, they were uh, an ensemble, a group that presents us with, on average, more problems um, uh, of ethnical circumscription than, than other um, than other peoples, right? And and this is true, of course, in in, in a, by a certain degree for all the migration era um, populations, especially for the Ostrogoths. So finally, who were the Ostrogoths? From the Latin Ostrogoti or Austrogoti, right? Um, and we will look uh, now at the etymology of all this because uh, it's it's not fixed either, right? We we of course it, it, that means something pretty precise, but when it comes to define who was who in there, who was called like that, it's uh, it's a bit more complicated. So more simply, the, the Ostrogoths are obviously the eastern branch of the older Goths, hmm? this population that. Of Germanic origin that eventually, in fact, split into these groups um, towards the, uh, the the fourth century, uh, and uh, had the, um, the 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 most uh, the more conventional um, definition that we call, in fact, like Ostrogoths and Visigoths. But as we will see, uh, that it's basically a diplomatic slash ethnographic historiographical invention of the sixth century. Right, the Visigoths weren't even so simply defined as a unique group, um, and even to who was who before when they were in the steppes, let's say beyond the Roman borders is uh, Limes, let's say, uh, is not excessively clear. Um, and the Ostrogoths, in particular, trace their origins to the Greutungi or Greutungi, if you prefer, it was this branch of Goths who had migrated southwards. 
um, from the Baltic Sea and established a kingdom north of the Black Sea during roughly the 3rd and 4th centuries, right? They built an empire stretching from the Black Sea to the Baltic. We can't call it empire because we will see now how they dealt with the populations that they encountered. Also in here there is a great debate. I mean, who were the gods at that point? Um, what was the uh, ethnical composition of the people? Because these were areas that were inhabited by lots of other people in the same time, so it's kind of difficult. And the Ostrogoths were, um, during the 3rd century, probably literate. Um, their trade with the Roman Empire was highly developed, so they, they lived this um, period of splendor um, in this Danubian slash uh, kind of Ukrainian area, we can say in modern terms, that reached its zenith under King Ermanaric, who is in fact, together with Theodoric in later times, considered the greatest king of this uh, polity, this group. And um, and Ermanaric, however, also saw the, the end of this first phase of splendor as he committed um, su suicide, um, allegedly, at an old age when the Huns arriving from the eastern, um, from the east, um, from the steppes, uh, attacked uh, the Ostrogoths and subjugated them around the, the 370 AD. And after their annexation by the Huns, little was heard of the Ostrogoths for about 80 years, after which they reappeared in this Danubian uh, region, the stretch from Red, from Pannonia, but down south also towards Mesia, as we will see. Um, in the middle Danube as federati of the Romans, right? So as Roman allies, so more or less framed into this, we can't call kind of a Roman commonwealth more, more than else, because as you know, the, the relation between Rome and these peoples was very, you know, complex and, um, and very fascinating. We will take a look at it. And after the collapse of the Han Empire, um, at, at the Battle of uh, Nedao in 453, that happened somewhere, as we will see later in, in you know in Pannonia, um, probably uh, maybe the Nedao River is considered to be a tributary of the Sava River, but we have no certainty about that. And um, this was basically the battle in which the, the, the Germans that had been subjugated by the the Huns at one point managed to shake. Their, the the Hunnic yoke from from them by defeating in fact uh, Attila's sons in battle and the Ostrogoths were seemingly among these peoples uh, um, although they um, they seemingly didn't contribute terribly to to the victory themselves but we we don't really know uh, in practice um, and at, at this point the Ostrogoths moved uh, migrated westwards towards uh, Illyria and also the borders of Italy. While a group of them, that is, it was normally uh, normal at the time, uh, remained in the lands that they had inhabited in, in the Ukraine, in the region southern Russian, today's um, Crimea, actually, were, uh, in fact, the Crimean Ostrogoths existed as a distinct people uh, with kind of the, still their own Germanic uh, language in origin until the, the 16th century even beyond, which is very, very interesting. And um, and then there is this new phase of splendor uh, happening between the late uh, 5th and, and 6th centuries under King Theodoric the Great, right? Where, when most of the Ostrogoths moved first to Mesia around the 70s and the 80s of the 5th century and later in 493 established the so-called Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy when Theodoric defeated the Germanic uh, leader Odoacer's forces and killed uh, his uh, rival Germanic chieftain, uh, uh, taking his place as uh, ruler in the Italian peninsula. Um, and um, this fundamentally, um, you know, we'll look at all this in detail now, but as you know, that evolved within to the uh, into this prosperous phase of, of, of uh, Theodoric's monarchy uh, in Italy that is considered legitimately as the greatest success of coexistence between Romans and, and Germans. Um, uh, and um, 
that, however, came to an end after the death of Theodoric, where things had started already to um, uh, to uh, to be more agitated and unstable. And uh, as a consequence of this instability, uh, the uh, Roman Emperor Justinian declared war to the Ostrogoths in 535, and um, r invaded Italy itself to to reconquer to bring it. Uh, once again, under the direct Roman rule, and as you know, they uh, the, the Byzantines were initially successful, but eventually it was the uh, the, the Ostrogothic comeback with Totila, um that, however, was ultimately defeated to at the Battle of uh, Tagine. And this war was, uh, as you know, extremely destructive for for Italy. It was a um, fought basically back and forth across the peninsula two or three times, and it would trigger very important changes in the area that also favored eventually the absor uh, absorption of the remaining Ostrogoths into the Longobard uh, people and kingdom later. Um, so let's take a look more in detail to, to all this story because um, it's, it's, it's really epic in many ways. I, I rarely use this term when I basically, I think this is the first time in 530 videos that, that I ever used it. Because objectively telling the history of these peoples um, is, is, is telling the history of a, of, of a great um, um, Epopy, a great adventure in 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 their own eyes, right? We th this is a topic that maybe we we won't be explaining today in detail, but we will. I will have to make videos on uh, that is in fact the different um, perception that we have from, of course, the Roman historiography and the, and what we can um, theoretically uh, speculate what the, the the Germanic one was you know, on on the base of of course what we know about their culture about their view of the world um etc because um sometimes th this history is told in either black or white uh, uh you know patterns and we and however um either mixing um them all as if black and white didn't even exist or as if it was like distinct as if you can easily isolate what what is germanic what is roman it, it it's much more complicated and 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 that's why it's worth the pain talking about this times and um why we sh we should be able to i think to to have the courage to to tell these stories from from what we can um objectively realize about what this mentalities were because there is not very often we we have the history of and the position of an elite right um the, the, there is this enormous myth that history is written by the winners the, this is absolutely false uh history is written by historians right and 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 the point here is to understand you know to discriminate of course between the good and the bad historian but also trying to to understand what is that these peoples wanted us to to remember about them because this doesn't vanish like in a uh, overnight, right? The 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 end of um, of several Germanic populations, such as the Ostrogoths, came uh, through a war, right? That disgregated basically their not their ethnic um, uh, character meant as a uh, you know they, they lived on. You know, we we Europe has seen the survival of the Ostrogoths, but not as a poli po as a polity anymore, not as a kingdom anymore. We've seen how they got absorbed by other peoples, how they. Uh, eventually disappeared even as a language we'll look at it now but um how still the, these peoples had made a difference right and we we know this and this is not being concealed to us we we actually know what their story has been about and the same romans were quite interested in such things actually um the the same god ostrogothic ethnogenesis was nobilitated by roman um, ethnography, historiography, think about Cassiodorus in Italy, you know, that that moment of uh, coexistence between the two peoples in, in the in the Italic kingdom was very meaningful even for, for our understanding of uh, not just of the Ostrogoths or the Romans but also of other peoples that in, in, in you know were comprehended in the storytelling of, of, of this relation and makes us understand 
you know the, the importance that um, the, the Germanic populations had for the in in the transformation of Europe in, in the world uh, it is today still within uh, the the Roman sphere of influence but still having a, a very important impact. These these aren't uh, peoples that didn't leave a trace, didn't leave a mark, didn't make a difference. These were peoples that had their own story, they had their own beliefs, uh, they had their own identity and vision of the world. And I think the best thing we can do is is to look at history chiefly through this, because that's what really matters. That's true. That's what really moved this population. That's really what. Um, uh, I'm, I'm talking for every kind of people here, not just about the Germans, but also about the Romans. And, 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 and that's where the patterns, the, the shaded, but yet the, the more objective and consistent picture appears at the same time. So uh, let's not divide things, once again, in black and white, but also let's not, them, let's not um, presume that we're kind of all equal, all flat and all grade in the same tonality. No, it wasn't like that. And this is what we will be trying to do, to, to observe uh, today. So, a division of the gods is first attested in 291 AD. The Thervingi are the first attested around this date. Um, then the Greutungi, or Greutungi if you prefer, the Vesi and the Ostrogoti are all attested no earlier than 388 AD. The Greutungi are first named by Ammianus Marcellinus, that was writing no earlier than 392 and perhaps later than 395, and um, basing his account on the words of a Thurbingian chieftain was attested as early as 376 AD. Um, the Ostrogoths are first named as such in a document dated in uh, September 392 from Milan, uh, while Claudian mentions that uh, they were, together with the Greutungi, uh, inhabiting uh, Phrygia, hmm? this region of Asia Minor. Um, so here we, we immediately get into the, the ethnographical ambiguities, like we will see that, that the picture is, is different, but it's already interesting that we are fundamentally distinguishing several groups already, including the so-called Ostrogoti that will go that will give the name to the Ostrogoths proper as separated for example from the Greutungi or the Tervingi right so um, this already tells us what that we can decipher this differences well not so much um, actually we can't but we can immediately understand that these were different groups that this population was composed by different entities that also called themselves in a certain way that they were recognized by Roman historiographers as um, something distinct right there's this great eminent Austrian historian on, on the period um, Herwig Wolfram that uh, according to whom the primary sources um, about the Ostrogoths either use the terminology of Tervingi slash Greutungi or Vesi slash Ostrogoti. And interestingly, they never mix the pairs. So, for example, all these f all four names were used together, but the pairing was always preserved. Like, uh, if you say uh, in order, Greutungi, Ostrogoti, Tervingi, Vesi. So here you, you, you always see that... Um, this pairs uh, and like uh, the Tervingi were the, um, the they never switched, right? So that the, the Tervingi were would be essentially considered by some the Vesi um, slash Visigothi and the Greutungi uh, the Ostrogoth, and th this is a um, conception supported also by Jordanus that identified the Visigothic kings later on from uh, Alaric I to Alaric II as the heirs of the 4th century Tervingian king Athanaric and the Ostrogothic kings from Theodor Theodoric uh, the Great to Theodad as the heirs of the Grotungian king Ermanaric. Right? This interpretation uh, is still very common in historiography so that basically um, it, it, it would show the original division between um, Ostrogoths and uh, West Goths, so Eastern Goths and Western Goths, but this is um, somewhat uh, debated, especially today. 
Um, and um, it's, it's not universal, at least. Uh, according to the Jordanus Jetica, for example, so according to, to, to him, to this older himself, around 400 AD, the Ostrogoths were ruled by uh, this um, a chieftain um, known as Ostrogoth, and that derived their name from this so-called father of the Ostrogoths, albeit Today, modern historians, for example, assume the, the converse that Ostrogoda was named after the people, right? Um, and uh, both um, Wolfram and Barnes uh, conclude that the terms Tervingi and Greutungi were geographical identifiers used by each tribe to subscribe the other, right? So that there was already this um, division uh, based mostly on where they were settled on this wide area that we'll see now between the Baltic and the Black Seas. Um, the terminology hence was dropped out of use after the Goths were displaced by the Hunnic invasions as we'll see. So in support of this, for example, Volter, uh, uh, Wolfram cites Zosimus um, uh, as referring to a group of uh, Scythians that living north of the Danube who were called as Greutungi. Hmm? Um, by the barbarians north of the Easter, so north of, of the Danube Reef. And Wolfram, uh, in particular, asserts that it was the Tervingi who remained behind after the Hunnic uh, conquest. Right? He further believes that the terms Vesi and Ostrogothi, for example, were used by the peoples to boastfully describe themselves in a, uh, in a way that... Uh, in the sense, I suppose, didn't quite match what the, the internal divisions were really about. Um, so, the, 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 the connection between especially the Tervingi and the um, Visigoths uh, is, is debatable, albeit instead, the one between the Greutungi and the Ostrogothi, the Ostrogoths, uh, is, is kind of acceptable. I mean, it's possible that they were basically kind of the same people, all, obviously, with all the reserves that we can have in such, you know, um, times and spaces, um, political um, identities and organization. And the nomenclature of Greutungi and Tervingi fell out of use, uh, uh, as we've seen shortly after the 5th century. Um, in general, the terminology of a divided Gothic people disappeared gradually, after they entered the Roman Empire. The term Visigoth, however, was an invention of the 6th century, as we were saying before, as Cassiodorus, as a prominent Roman scholar in the service of Ther King Theodoric the Great uh, in Italy, invented the term Visigothi mm, to match the Ostrogothi, which was referring, in Cassiodorus' mind, as to as, um, in fact, Western, Goths and Eastern Goths, respectively, because at the time, objectively, you know, the, the Ostrogoths were in Italy, the Visigoths were in Spain, so this kind of made sense. Um, the, the Western Eastern division, however, in this sense, is a simplification and a, liter a literary device of the 6th century historians, right? Um, while political realities, even within these peoples, were um, had been and still were more complex than that. Furthermore, Cassiodorus used the term Goths to refer only to the Ostrogoths, interestingly enough, whom he served, and reserved the geographical term Visigoths for, for the Gallo-Hispanic Goths. So this is particularly important because it was somewhat perceived that the, kind of the true Goths, at least from the uh, uh, this Italian uh, scholar, was the one of, of, of uh, the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy, while the, the Gallo-Hispanic ensemble was somewhat um, lesser, right? And this is supported also later on. We will today. Now we are talking about exclusively about the etymology. Later in the video, we will talk about what was in fact the relation at the time. Objectively, the Ostrogoths were more powerful than the Visigoths. They had managed to, to frame them into this greater. Uh, Gothic, um, say, Commonwealth was a very important uh, axis against the Byzantines and the Franks. I mean, a very complicated story. We already discussed it in part on Schwerpunkt. If you go in the Migration Era playlist, it's full of that. Um, but it, it's still very meaningful that Cassiodorus uses this, um, this distinction. Um, 
Interestingly enough, however, the same Visigoths adopted this usage uh, themselves in their communications with the Byzantine Empire. And it was in use, for example, in the 7th century. So even after that the Ostrogoths in Italy had been wiped out, um, and the Visigothic Kingdom remains in, in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, other names for the Goths abounded. Right? Um, for example, a, a Germanic, uh, say, Germanic Byzantine or Italian author referred to one of the two peoples, interestingly enough, as the Valagoti, right? Uh, meaning the Roman Goths. Um, and this is very interesting because it, it, it Vala means um, foreign, right? It, it's the, the idea of um, that, uh, it, that it's actually not Roman but Germanic. This, this idea from the Germans, a voice called Vala, is, is the Roman speaker. Right or even the Celtic speaker, so that they saw it as non uh, non German speakers. This is interestingly enough because even regions you know, of Europe, such as Wallachia, right uh, in the south of Romania, uh, bear the name from this because um, those were uh, intensely la uh, you know Latinized areas. They spoke, in fact, they still speak um, Romance language. So it was perceived by the Germans like that. So it's very fascinating that in this late antique period uh, also the Balagothi uh, um, term is used because it was stressing the, the deep romanization that these peoples had undergone over time. right? And this thing of the romanization is now very um, we will explain it during the video, but um, also you have, it, it's what I was talking about at the beginning in terms of black and white, right? We have to remain pretty open to understanding what, that these are perspectives of peoples that lived at the time. It doesn't tell us how much Romanized they were. Indeed, the Goths were the most Romanized peoples in absolute terms um, among the Germanic ones, especially the Visigoths. Um, yet, uh, this doesn't mean that we, we should equivocate on the context of, of this level of Romanization. We, we have to understand what was in fact was overthrown of the, kind of the older Germanic order, what was maintained instead, in, in especially, especially in political um, in political terms, because as we will see, especially um, during the Gothic War, after the death of Theodoric, but already during the Ostrogothic Kingdom uh, of Italy and up to the Gothic War, this internal divisions between the Goths relatively to Romanity or Germanity and also relatively, uh, you know, respectively towards Catholicism and Arianism, because that was a big deal, mm, uh, entailed two very different uh, visions of the world and, and culture, and this was also probably a factor that divided internally the same gods at one point, and it didn't surely didn't play uh, very in favor of their um, in in their situation or of them during uh, that situation. Um, now, this is interesting that um, in in 484 the Ostrogoths had been called uh, the Valamerieci, then instead. Uh, means uh, the men of Valamir because um, they followed um, Theodoric, who was a descendant of Valamir, and this terminology survived uh, in Constantinople late as the reign of Athalaric, right? That was the king of of, of the Ostrogoths in Italy between 526 and 534, who was called um, in Greek to. Um, Uleme Riaco by uh, John Malalus, the great um, you know chronicler from from Antioch. The etymology of the gods. Um, so today we will not concentrate specifically on the gods previously to the splitting in, into the two groups, but of course we have to say that the, the Gothic name makes its first appearance in the Roman sources between 16 and 18 A.D. Right. So uh, this entity was fairly old, right, um, pre-existing the same uh, Roman conquest of, of Germany in those in those 20 years that it was subdued. Um, and with early, uh, early indications related to the Guti of Scandia, right, or possibly even a a attributable to the uh, Gutones. Procopius wrote that the Goths in Thule um, you know of the of this 
area that is kind of magic, kind of mythological, this great north of this great island in, 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 with, in, uh, covered in ice, you know, this great north. Uh, while Cassiodorus mentions the Gauti gods am amid his list of Scandinavian peoples. So, two distinct groups of Gothic peoples are first attested, as we were saying before, in 200, uh, two in 291. The western Turbingi Vesi and the eastern Greutungi Ostrogothi. Right. Greutungi, um, meaning uh, probably steppe dwellers mm -hmm. or people of the pebbly coasts. This root Greut, for example, is probably related to the old English Greut, meaning flat. Hence the flatland in this Ukrainian steppes, what they had settled at that point. And this is supported by evidence that geographic descriptors were commonly used to distinguish people living north of the Black Sea, both before and after um, Gothic settlement there. And by the lack of evidence for an earlier date for the name uh, Pear Tervingi Greutungi than the late 3rd century. However, that the name Greutungi has a pre-Pontic and possibly, in fact, Scandinavian origins has support, right? These populations, even if at that point were already probably largely mixed with local inhabitants, um, they, they probably had uh, um, derived fr really from, from, a, from a people coming from, from the north um, of Germanic origin. And wanting to look at an etymology of the term, um, the term Greutungi may mean kind of rock people related to the old Norse Grut uh, Huningi to distinguish the Ostrogoths from the Jeats, right, referred as gods in Scandinavia, right, because this, th th that's where it gets very complicated, so we're not going to descend, but you know, here the difference was chiefly f from, you know, the, the kind of the Interland and, the, and Götaland, Gothland in southern Sweden. So it's very complicated at that point to, to really understand what we were talking about. In the case of the Ostrogoths, it's complicated by the fact that, um, albeit I personally believe, and several scholars, I think of Germanists also met, we actually believe that it's perfectly plausible that the Goths came from, from Scandinavia, um, from this area in the east in Sweden. Uh, but um, the, the concept is, however, that uh, we... Uh, we, the, the word distinctions within the same peoples there at the time. So, um, and and that um, it's 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 very complicated to really draw a line in here and saying ah that they came from that group from that group. It was rather the Roman historiography who wanted to find a connection with populations that. Um, inhabited Scandinavia for the Goths. This was a way for nobilitating them for the sake that we will see later with this now with this phase in which the Goths had entered Roman borders, they, they they were settled, they were even used by the same Roman emperors to in fact control certain areas like even Italy as, as a wall, you know, Theodoric was sent there to govern on behalf of, of the Roman Emperor. Um, so that technically you know, there were the Ostrogoths ruling in Italy, but not that Italy belonged to the Goths, right? This was the conception. And at that point, it was this great work of civilization to give the Goths this um, more certain uh, or original um, story that would can make them fit together with other Germanic populations in this common origin from Scandinavia. It was perceived as such at the time while, in fact, um, trying to trace the direct connection is, mu is very difficult. And so we think of a kind of um, historiographical invention, especially for the Ostrogoths, uh, that, as we know, were very, very mixed, and in, the, in their history was later built, in fact, um, this is quite apparent. I mean, the, 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 the myth the, of the origins is all a mix of, you know, uh, classical ethnographical cliches. It's a, there is probably some truth to it, we, we don't want to say that they didn't come, there, but uh, um, for uh, differently from other peoples, we, we, we don't have a clear, direct connection, right, with the, the Scandinavian origin um, on paper, which doesn't mean that it, that it didn't exist. This is probably not important. What, what I would like to make you understand is that when we talk about the migration here, such distinctions um, are meaningful up to a certain point, right? Um, you know, given the... the, the 
the total mess that area was in the fact that is that we don't really know uh, how it was like who was wound there etc um, and and the degree of commixtion that existed between these populations especially in the case of the Goths that the, the, the word basically the Germans went further east than, than any uh, anyone else uh, well that is you know the, stressing that this origin is quite unlikely you know probably the Goths effectively com coming from Scandinavia settled into um, into what would be today's uh, kind of uh, northern Poland roughly and then descended following the the Vistula Valley towards the Carpathians and eastwards towards the Ukrainian plains Moldova and also as we will see now parts of Romania um, and beyond at one point also because there were many you know one thing that emerges from the about the gods is that at least before the um, the Hanuk invasions their mm, the, their polity ruled over a, a, a great number of peoples that in great part were not Germanic right and so what happens especially after the Hanuk upheaval is, is very complicated also because the, the Ostrogoths disappear from our radar f uh, for like 80 years and this is very important whatever happened there we, we, we can't fundamentally know um, so uh, the 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 etymology uh for example the roman historian jordanus re re refers to an uh, evagreutinj yeah that that would be the grautung island in in skansa right as a part of this description of the god is skansa now what is this is it scandia is it this area of southern uh, you know sweden what, what is we, we don't clearly no, these were names that the same gods probably remembered in their mm, mm, historical memory, um, and and th they are naturally um, concepts and geographical locations at the same time. But as not being scientifically categorized and with the geographical knowledge of the time, it's basically impossible to to trace them back. But obviously, we can trace parallelisms to that. We can identify this area of southern Scandinavia. But we can't be fully sure. There have been uh, attempted to to show that um, certain um, names, uh, place names in Poland, uh, could have been somewhat related to the Greutungi, But there also in that case, there, there, there doesn't seem to be any particular evidence, even if we know that they passed through there. So naturally, you have to imagine there's a semi-nomadic populations at this time. They had a very, um, you know, they, they had a very complex and fascinating view of, of, of space, um, and um, that, however, was much more loaded with symbolic and spiritual meanings rather than actual, in fact, geographical awareness as such, which, in my opinion, makes it even more interesting because um, that tells you way more about. Uh, their semi-nomadism, the, 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 the way they, con how they conceived the places they inhabited and what is said truly mattered to them in, uh, up to a certain point rather than, in fact, saying, okay, well, they were here, I give you the coordinates, they were, we can't know that, and probably we don't even know, uh, we don't even need to know that, right? Um, so, um, um, Ostrogothi um, means... Um, uh, we we have translated in fact as uh, we've seen in the normalization of sixth century like the eastern gods right but actually the meaning being a bit more loaded in um in significance especially from a spiritual point of view because ostrogothi would mean simply gods um of or glorified by the rising sun right this idea that the rising sun uh, coming from the east and therefore um, embracing the gods during their, their advance this is where they probably go at the moment in which they got Christianized they started um, you know involve, you know, having this uh, solar symbolism attached also to monotheism etc um, the swastika f figures prominently into the Ostrogothic art exactly because of this powerful solar symbol that they felt to be you know dignified and glorified by in fact this is the great glory of the Ostrogoths and their um, their, their pride, their of their identity, right? Um, being converted to Christianity as Aryans, right? And interestingly enough, also contributing to the Christianization of other Germanic peoples 
without Roman mediations. For example, the Longobards at this point were mm, that we don't even we don't clearly know even in that case, even if we can not roughly figure that, but uh, we know that they were in contact with the gods and they were very superficially, <laughs> let's say, Christianized by the by the gods themselves. To Arianism, in fact, then then that's the the, the point. And, and and that's where the gods start assuming, in fact, a, pe a peculiar position through Arianism toward the same Roman Empire. Because, as you know, um, Arianism here, it's not really a matter of uh, of real belief. Like, the Arian um, heresy is fundamentally uh, an idea that, that uh, the son has a lesser uh, degree of divinity of the father by being the same god. As as Christ, but the the Germans for the Germans it was easier to see uh, Jesus as a sort of uh, Germanic hero, right? For which he is not the divinity, as such is not the 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 the, the omni powerful, omnipotent God of the sky, but uh, affiliation for which he was the kind of the hero of the situation, and therefore he was a lesser from his father, and, that, and that's what uh, Arianism that stressed kind of the more the, the human. Um, f nature of Christ um, uh, and uh, extending the balanced view of Catholicism uh, but this uh, aside from these anthropological differences in the vision of the divinity and the transition to Christianity um, it's really a political stand like being an Aryan at this point at this point there hadn't been that I know any Germanic group in fact that had ever converted to Catholicism like the first the, the only ones who would do that would be the Franks in the late 5th century um, with Clovis that we discussed at length on Schwerpunkt um, but um, the the Arianity in this sense was um, a political shout out an international manifesto to say okay yes we convert to Christianity but we are still something different from the Empire like which means we embrace our, your god into our mm, paganism and we 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 acknowledge him in this solar power in this as a major god because the empire the, the germans recognized the power of the roman empire they recognized the fact that, that was the universal empire in the sense it was like the most powerful thing out there so their god had to be pretty damn powerful um uh, as well and, and they and, and 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 the germans adopted christianity for this reason but they they also wanted to say okay you are romans but you are catholics so you believe this thing that we don't fully understand that maybe you know our scholarly individuals understand but more or less because take also ulfilas and in fact the conversion of the gods that happened through this corruption of the of the uh, nicene um uh, in fact, uh, creed, and and uh, and 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 that's uh, what Arianism is. But we, but Arianism means also that we are a kind of a, um, op, let's say, uh, of an option, um, a, a different um, model of power from Rome, because the Germans uh, recognized the Roman imperial power, but they didn't feel to be inferior to it. Um, and on the contrary, they they thought they could uh, share that they could participate to that power by winning the divinity, right? So they inherently felt that you know I don't know their their model of masculinity was the Germanic warrior. The Romans just weren't weren't were not like that. It was not they were not as men as they were, um, and by men I mean literally warriors uh, because that's literally the same thing. So. That's the deeper meaning, and 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 I stress this so much because actually the Ostrogoths were the real champions of, of Arianism, and we will see it later on that their um, political uh, existence corresponded very very importantly to this, and especially in the case of the Ostrogoths, because the Visigoths the Visigoths were Arians themselves. But they had a different path. The, the Ostrogoths, if you want to remain more, um, more uh, uh, and, and longer at contact with this uh, grandeur of the origins that, as we will see now, that they had had at one point, even challenging the Roman Empire from the Pontic steppes and la launching raids. And uh, as you know, the Goths were, um, there, there were many. I mean, it's difficult even to frame them because they, they pop out. 
uh, every once in a while, even in places you wouldn't expect, even in the middle on the middle Danube, uh, let, I don't know, in the places like today's Austria, while well, the, the core of their power was in, in, in today's Ukraine, right? Something like that. So there were many groups, and they were kind of aggressive, and they caused a lot of trouble into um, into the, uh, along the Danubian frontier and in the eastern Mediterranean, Black Sea, and in the Aegean. They, ar they arrived up to Cyprus, right, to raid, and the, the Romans were deeply concerned by that because Albite Egypt was still in, uh, you know, in, in Roman hands, still, you know, the, the Pontic Steppe had been a, quite of a place of interest for the Romans in terms of grain supplies for the empire in general since the time of, of Nero, you know, and uh, the Romans cared now about this quite strong block that was forming there. And and, and the Goths were, in this sense, yes, th that's why before I was talking to you about the be, be careful when we talk about Romanization, because Romanization doesn't necessarily mean um, like f feeling like as if they were Romans, or that they they didn't have another vision of the story, or that um, their Germanism wasn't um, influencing their their relation with Rome, also in kind of um, uh, with enmity, because th this happened. The Goths were alternatively kind of friends and, and foes of the Romans, and uh, and the, sa the same integration of the Goths within the Roman borders was, we see it sometimes as a success of the Roman Empire, but it was also, as you know, after Adrianople, quite of a troubling factor. Right, you know, the, the Adrianople. Okay, those were the Visigoths, even if there were a, 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 um, some Ostrogoths as well, especially in the cavalry during the battle. Ostrogothic cavalry, being coming more from the east, was the, kind of the toughest one. Um, they contributed um, in a determining way to the outcome of that battle. Um, but uh, right after Adrianople, it wasn't a disaster at all. Like the, the Roman Empire, and didn't have problems of the, the alleged barbarization of the army. Uh, they could field other Roman armies, even clashing against each other in a very few decades. Uh, the whole um, Theodosian propaganda was about having turned, in fact, these ferocious barbarians into um, into civilized peasants and also in s more or less disciplined Roman soldiers. Yes, the Visigoths did cause some trouble at one point just after Adrianople, like because when they were up to one third of the army in certain places in the east, um, but they were absorbed eventually by the empire um, in, in the army, uh, and they, uh, they they also paid actually a very heavy toll of blood for Rome. Right, the only problem being that they remained as a unique people, and and this, uh, in spite at one point Rome could wipe them out repeatedly, still for political. Uh, games they they kind of survived as you know they passed into Italy they sacked Rome then they went back and forth and eventually went in southern Gaul when they founded their kingdom eventually also expanding to Spain so um, this compromised the unity especially of the West and the same Ostrogothic history as we will see now will be essentially that because the, the Byzantines at one point kicked them out uh, say, okay go to Italy take that and now we'll be as long as you go get the hell out of Illyria because we don't like you here Right, because you're too dangerous for Constantinople. Um, so it's a history of um, we have to be honest here. We have to be concrete. We don't have to hide. You know, we we have to stress the positive as well as the negative uh, relations. We can't interpret them just like in a monolithic uh, pattern, right? And saying you know, oh, these were enemies or these were just friends. You know, it, it, it's all very very uh, shaded depending on on the situation. So, um, the and and the Goths, in fact, to to finish the the, the reflection, were um, also the, uh, the 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 Ostrogoths, especially this by the sixth century, this champions of Arianism, that was uh, conceived as a as an alter no no really as an alter ego as such, but uh, as an alternative. This is what I wanted to to say to the Roman Empire to the model of Catholicization and in part even of Christianization as many peoples even from Central Europe that weren't yet Christianized so at uh, the Ostrogoths as uh, and the Gothic bloc um, more in general when when uh, Theodoric also adopted the uh, minor Visigothic king 
um, forming this bond between uh, Italy and Spain as the alternative uh, against uh, the extremely uh, aggressive Merovingian power that was rising with the Roman and Catholic banner uh, and, and the same Roman Empire at that point. So uh, the whole story is uh, very fascinating because it, it, it was in turn reflected in the struggle, on the internal struggle of the people, as we will see later on. Um, so um, by the... Um, there are many more important things about the gods also. By the 4th century, for example, the Ostrogoths had developed a distinct language known as Gothic, uh, which has been classified by linguists as an East Germanic language. Um, in the case of Goths, it's kind of unequivocal because sometimes uh, even the Elb Germans are usually fitted into the Eastern branch, some don't. Well, the Ostrogoths were literally the easternmost thing ever, so we, we don't escape there, but it's, it's still important because it's kind of basically the, um, you know, the Gothic language died out sometimes in the Middle Ages, and uh, both the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths were absorbed by uh, other European uh, peoples. Um, but while none of the Eastern Germanic languages are still spoken, Gothic is the only one with continuous texts remaining. Now, this is extremely important. Um, the, the, the singularly most important work amid the surviving Gothic texts is the translation of the Bible of the Visigothic bishop Ulfilas, mm -hmm. comprising the earliest remnants of the Germanic languages known. Um, uh, smatterings of the Gothic language can be found in Italian, but its presence is minimal. Um, a language uh, related to Gothic was still spoken sporadically in Crimea as late as the 16th, but even 17th century, so the, the so-called Crimean Gothic language that objectively seems to have been a uh, remnant, uh, even ethnically speaking, because some anthropologists featured like kind of very Germanoid looks in this southernmost Crimean area where the, 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 the language was spoken at the time. Now, of course, after the 20th century, much of social engineering, like that, there is completely uh, everything has been altered, but you know, probably died out earlier. Um, well, that that probably remained from the the original Ostrogoths that dwelled in there, um, and of course, much of the disappearance of the Gothic language in general is attributable to the Goths' cultural and linguistic absorption by other European peoples during the Middle Ages. O always remember that doesn't matter how big these po uh, populations were. And sometimes they really were, uh, right? You know, the, 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 they, the Ostrogoths that invaded Italy, for example, in 489, were, were, the, the were not a few. Like, there might have been up to one, 100 thousands, right? But still there is no comparison with the degree of population of the Mediterranean uh, regions. So we're talking about in the range of millions, right? So um, over time, these peoples that ev didn't even have kind of a truly written tradition... Um, you know, spread in within the, the same people, obviously adopted Romance languages in the, the grew even ethnically, that is chiefly juridically speaking in that sense, uh, part of the local populations. When, when you talk about ethnicities here, you don't have to be equivocal. Okay, here we don't talk about genetics. Here we talk about what it meant to be a goth at the time. And this is a huge topic that, of course, has to do with is one of the major t uh, themes of the, uh, historiographically speaking, of the Volker Wanderung and the, uh, you know, w w what is that these peoples felt to be part of, right? And this Germanic nuclear that, that shifted from the Scandinavian, Central Europe, were pretty inclusive in the sense they needed a lot of demographic strength to survive in this pretty troubled uh, picture. So they absorbed many uh, foreign, we can't say, elements that became Germanic in this sense, meaning that they began to obey Germanic law, to speak a Germanic language, but otherwise they were coming from other other peoples, other cultures. There were Sarmatians, there were uh, uh, Celts, there were Romanized populations, there were Turks, there were uh, early Slavs. There was a bit of everything. And um, and especially in the case of the Gos of, of the Ostrogoths, this seems to have been really the case because they were the ones that came to rule over a much larger uh, population than the others, 
they they uh, went far east, so very far from the Germanic kind of um, heartland. If we can't talk about such a thing for this high, and they and and they and even for certain equestrian zootechnic capabilities, a certain uh, also metallurgical skill, we we know that they they adopted a lot of other peoples uh, within them and uh, that characterized them I in a very fascinating way because the Ostrogoths in fact are remembered among all the other Germans as the most um, equestrian um, um, type, right? As the ones that developed this greater um, th this greater cavalry and mounted uh, fighting costumes, uh, etc. Always remembering, though, that when even when we talk about the Ostrogoths, that these weren't really the exact copy of a steppes people, as someone would like to to say. Um, have a pretty strong mm, and sound opinion of this. Like if you look at their equipment, their uh, the uh, accounts of this battle, says you realize that we're essentially still Germans. Like they might have had a solid uh, cavalry. Um, uh, you know, unit. Um, they, they might have been definitely all about this idea of the um, of the no nobility and leadership uh, um, on horseback. That is something that the Germans technically already had. Like all the Indo-European peoples, even if they in the forest of Germany, they had kind of lost the. the you know the the practice. Even they still, if, if they still had cavalry anyway, but fundamentally the majority of them would fight on foot, right? As they weren't like, I don't know, the Sarmatians had been, and even those peoples progressively had settled down, become kind of more infantry. Surely they weren't anything like the Huns, right? B but now, when we will arrive to the Huns, we also notice that actually Attila had a very high reputation of the go of the Ostrogoths, and and partly that this happened also because they were good good cavalrymen and they they participated considerably even to to the Hunnic success right so these were in turn uh, peoples that were passed now under this other foreign masters just as they had subdued themselves before other other populations but we'll see it now uh, in a while and so passing to in fact more concrete aspects um, mentioned in several sources up to the 3rd century AD when they apparently split into at least two groups the Grevutungi in the east and the Tervingi in the west very roughly the two Gothic tribes, let's call them this way shared many aspects uh, especially recognizing a patron deity uh, the Romans named Mars and um, this is um, this so-called split, as we have defined before, more appropriately, this resettlement of the Western tribes into the Roman province uh, of Dacia was uh, is interpretable as a natural result of population saturation of the area uh, north of the Black Sea. Right, uh, the Goths slowly um, expanded towards that direction. This kind of fairly fertile plains of the um, Danubian uh, region uh, you know that Mesia was fundamentally the only Danubian area where there was some sort of uh, um, of, of enough uh, agricultural wealth along <laughs> all over the, the border and, and in the east um, towards these uh, great rivers like the the Nest or the, the Dnieper that uh, were these major waterways at the time connected with the Mediterranean and with all these uh, regions of, of the north where from which amber skins uh, uh, force um, ferocious animals were, were, were pretty valuable um, trade um, material right and um, and and yes so part of them expanded into Roman Dacia at one point was was given up by by Aurelian, if I'm not wrong, said okay, let's uh, let's just leave it that because it, it it had never been it had been a quite of a militarized area. Yeah, that there had been mines there, but the, the Romanization had now ran out of of local resources, also in part to, to maintain itself. 
um, in in the area, this Carpathian basin had always been threatened by populations from the from the Ukrainian steppes, like the Sarmatians, etc. So things had deteriorated, and the Goths in Dacia established a vast and powerful kingdom during the third and fourth centuries between the Danube, in fact, the Dnieper, uh, in what is today's Romania, Moldova, and Western Ukraine. Um, this is conceived as a multi-tribal state ruled by a Gothic elite, but inhabited by many other interrelated but multi-tongued tribes, um, including the Iranian-speaking Sarmatians, the Germanic-speaking Jebets, the uh, Thracian-speaking Dacians, Tracolians, like, um, but also other minor Celtic and Thracian tribes, and possibly also early Slavs, that weren't objectively very far from the think about the Pripyat marshes near the Slavs surely followed in, in, in some groups this this population. It's also maybe an as non free uh, not freely, right? You know, that they they also were uh, mobilitated by this um these invaders. And uh, unfortunately uh, the exact geographical dividing line between like this block that would have been later on the Visigoths and uh, and the Ostrogoths is not known, right? But in general terms, um, we can say roughly that the Visigoths occupied Dacia, Moldova, uh, Moldova and Wallachia, whereas the Ostrogoths lived in the steppe regions beyond the Dniester River, right? Ruling over a large confederation of Germanic and Scythian tribes, uh, or Sarmatian if you prefer, uh, but those were lands that also had been inhabited by the Scythians before the, the Sarmatians took over, so it always mixed in this sense, and covering a vast territory in what is now Ukraine and areas of southern Russia. And Jordanus calls the realm Oyum or Aoyum. Now, the etymology is very fascinating because even if uh, the author doesn't provide one, many scholars interpreted this word as a dative plural of the widespread Germanic words Aoyo or Aowo, uh, meaning well watered meadow or island. Now, this is very interesting because it, it's exactly what it was there. Uh, even the concept of island, think about the Zaporizhia uh, area later on that would be famous for the Cossacks. You know, th these were areas where terrific for um, for piracy, for trade, uh, even for military defense, right? Especially in areas that were like the steppes, so the waterways, the islands were also kind of uh, 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 kind of some of the only places you could technically hide or build some, you know, be more easily defended by these swarms of invaders that that existed all around. Uh, and this continuous raiding warfare. This is also where, in fact, probably the Gothic equestrian traditions developed the most, because aside from all this um, uh, Sarmatian elements that they integrated, would definitely knew a lot about horsemanship. Still, the same territory uh, obliges you to develop cavalry, right? Uh, as the Germans usually didn't have a, at least in the in the measure this uh, other uh, kind of semi nomadic populations uh, of the area had had and therefore getting acquainted wi with a type of military culture that will be very important also for the further development of western chivalry um, and that was a bit where all the Indo-Europeans had come from I mean came from the, the Caucasian steppes you know, they had all been semi nomads at one point, and even if they settled down, centralized into Western Europe, still, you know, in all Indo European religions, you find this reference to the deities of war that were on horseback. This is the idea of the glory, military glory of the sky, uh, the symbology of the horse um, as a celestial and tonic figure. I mean, this, this is pretty widely known history of religions. And uh, so. These areas are very fascinating because you, you can see a sort of back and forth like of influences and eventually as we will see now with the Hunnic invasions um, uh, you know this major wave that arrived and invested all of Europe and pushed lots of other peoples um, from east to west. So the rise of the Huns around 370 AD overwhelmed the Gothic 
kingdom we can say um, as you know we, we talked recently about Hans uh, the Romans and the Germans all together so we know the impact that the this population of unknown origin uh, coming from the the Eurasian steppes caused in the migration era in Europe all this domino effect right the trigger in fact the same migration of the Visigoths, the crossing of the Danube, the Battle of Adrianople, etc. Um, this was a dramatic moment uh, for, for the Goths, right? It was a major catastrophe. The, um, of course, the Huns weren't uh, literally destroying them as, as a people, but they were, however, uh, now ruling over them and imposing them their... their their direction. So the Visigoths managed to escape in this sense and even to overwhelm the Roman border defenses and entering inside the empire which was the uh, you know what was completely different now from what which everything had ever happened uh, as the Romans had often since ever settled groups of barbarians within their 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 territory since ever uh, in in the empire but um, this now, the, the great difference was made by an entire people that the Romans could not uh, dis digest as such, you could, couldn't uh, split and uh, to assimilate the scattering everywhere, that functioned still as, as a unique entity, right, that, that wandered within the, the, the imperial territory. Um, the Ostrogoths remained behind. And now we, we we don't know basically anything about what happened in there, but this was the fate of several other Germanic populations that at this point uh, were obliged to in fact either remain under Hunnic rule or entering the uh, trying to enter the empire, uh, as many would do at the beginning of the fifth century, especially in the West, like the Vandals, the Burgundians, the Alani, um, etc. Um, and, um, and and there was a, a different allegiance to to uh, because the Huns um, you know, obviously nobody likes to be ruled by anyone. Uh, the problem though is that the Huns were clever, of course, enough to render this vassal peoples uh, as allies, of course, to pillage Rome. So the the Germans had already done this. Um, in in their in their times, I mean, since the the, the 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 second half of the of the second century, they started creating increasing troubles on the Roman borders, uh, creating these confederations chiefly for military purposes, um, and they uh, they now started to 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 do that under the Huns in a dimension that was much more um, unilinear uh, towards the empire. Right, it was either you were pro or against, or better, either you were pro Han or pro Roman. Um, so, of course, whatever concerns the Roman side is pretty well known to us because uh, you know we know at that point uh, which populations were inside uh, the Roman borders and what they did and whatever. What happened outside, under the Huns, is 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 largely unknown. We we think that the Goths. Uh, of course, had their kingdom crushed, um, uh, it, it would be also interesting to deepen here what what this kingdom actually consisted in, because it was probably a set of uh, you know I'm also in here of a clientels of different tribes, etc. Um, but they maintained surely the, their identity as, as gods. Um, the 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 Ostrogoths are to be found frequently fighting alongside both the Alans and the Huns, right? Um, it was actually the Ostrogoths who were first subdued by the Huns because they were literally, as we've seen, the first people in the East, uh, the first Germanic people in the East that the Huns met. Now, think about the tragedy of this. Oh, I mean, a fairly prosper and also strategically aggressive uh, power in in southern in, in on the, uh, developing on the southern the trade um, tradeways riverways of southern Russia, that was able even to hit the Romans um, uh, via via sea and you know even w with some uh, naval capability, um, 
uh, that they resemble strikingly what would have happened 500 years later with the Varangians uh, in in the same geographical area, but with a bit of a difference in the sense that you know the, the Slavic uh, power, the Eastern Slavic powers, neither had already somewhat consistently developed, and it wasn't so so overwhelming like like. Um, as it what happened for, for for the gods, right? W what is interesting here, also I, I forgot to mention, is answering the question: Who were the gods at that point? Like um, the Germans were many, and they were kind of warlike. But all ethnographic sources tell us that um, the on the eastern frontier, the Germans were kind of subdued by the Scythians, right? That the the easternmost Germanic peoples had fundamentally. In the in the first centuries of Christianity, uh, being kind of in in uh, weaker than this Iranian uh, peoples of the steppes, um, evidently the tides had turned. Uh, this masses of gods had swarmed into th those territories, uh, exploiting the, the crisis of, of the Sarmatian uh, power, which truly existed at one point. But we can't exclude from the equation that many of what we call gods actually were Sarmatians as well, right? That there were uh, chieftains who had joined uh, the, the gods in, in this, in, in their... Um, in their journey in here uh, and, and deciding to to share power and to be part of this greater confederation um, so this was a world that had already lived kind of its own uh, story and its own forms of, of, of administration we can't think that the gods um, also arrived in the area participating in turn with the local um, with the local political uh, dynamics and then progressively having an ever greater impact so that eventually was fundamentally this gothic elite ruling over other peoples so this idea of c arriving and conquering and having this uh, military glory attached of course to, to the success of this migration and the establishment of this kingdom was identified as we have seen to this um, in, in their name, f from this um, symbology of the rising sun in the east, uh, in this uh, fl fairly florid uh, area for Germanic standards, that had allowed them to expand their power and consolidate. Just think what the Hanic invasion means in this sense. Um, their kingdom is over, is 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 taken over by the Huns, and they're obliged to follow them in a way or another. Right? So, um, it's a moment to probably. Um, in, in my opinion, uh, stamped, um, let's say, caused the sense of of revenge of, of the gods. I mean, this idea that um, that these weren't just tribes that had had kind of a humble living, uh, like the Longobards would do. The Longobards were were within this mass under the Huns, for example. They never had their own kingdom. They had their own. Um, prosperity, right? And eventually they evolved into something bigger. The, the gods instead now had had basically the single largest power that every Germanic, any Germanic people have ever had. Um, so um, this was the sense of, of an offended, of a hurt, of a um, uh, un unforgetting uh, uh, attitude towards the new conquerors, from which uh, they also learned a lot, evidently, but it also instilled in the gods also this need of restoring their past grandeur, right, that partially Theodoric, as we will see, w would manage to do, but still with the, the idea of the, probably of the, uh, of their identity based uh, on the ethnic group, on their uh, Aryan confession, uh, and therefore, in ways that, that in in their memory, still rejected the the, the, the full Romanization, right? um, and probably the Romans knew this too because the Romans had to fight against them, right? Uh, uh, at this point, they knew what they had been through. They understood they they would have done well before uh, w without the Huns, like the Visigoths had done by crossing the Danube and defeating the Roman legions. Um, but now th they had to deal so with, with someone who uh, it's fascinating to, with someone that doesn't quite that fights against you but not because 
but because he's being is being obliged to do it right? even if he was already kind of your enemy but not enemy up to that point um, maybe this sounds like a sophistry but actually it, it has a sense right because the relations with between the gods and the Romans would never be the same uh, probably and paradoxically the Hunnic um, the Hunnic domination um, increased somewhat the uh, the the awareness of the gods even towards the empire itself and the position they had to take right even if there was a hunnization chiefly of even of certain characters of the ruling elites we we know this that um, it is important even in terms of military culture fighting alongside a, a, a true people of the steppes a completely nomadic people right now the the Germans were uh, we call them semi nomadic but they were fundamentally like kind of mm, they have been sedentary for, for a long time. The Sarmatians, as we've seen, yeah, they were kind of semi-nomadic, but they had probably started to settle down in, in part. The Huns now were literally like the peoples of the steppes, and they had a completely different view of what the Germans, for example, had of the empire. Like the Germans, as the migration era would prove, were able to settle into Roman territory and to kind of govern it in some way. The Huns couldn't do that. The Huns were all about um, this um, raiding culture of conquerors that create um, a set of client states that they, they deal with, like with mm, mm, cows to, to, uh, to crop, right? You know, it, it's this... Um, and, and that's the relation the Huns had with the empire. Um, and, but just to make an example, um, like other tribal peoples, the Ostrogoths became one of the many hunting vassals fighting in Europe against the Romans, as for example in the Battle of Chalon in 451, where you have, uh, kind of ironically but very fascinatingly, from one side, uh, from the side of Attila you have the Ostrogoths, from the side of Etius you have the Visigoths, right? So you find even this uh, two blocks of the same people, more or less, that in spite of their original differences, they, were, they still call themselves as gods, that fight one against the other uh, on the same battlefield, in a hell of a battle, most single most important battle uh, of that time. And, and they do it in, in the name of, of different... Uh, they don't just do it under different banners. They do also it in, in different uh, views of what their um, their relation with these powers is. Nobody likes the situation within which they are. The gods recognize the uh, the inherent Germanism that their uh, their tradition represents, their identity, their values represent, uh, in opposition respectively to to the Romans and the Huns, but still they stress two different visions of the world because one uh, is under the Romans, another is under the Huns themselves. So is it, it's very fascinating and thought-provoking. Uh, we know that that period wasn't easy. You know, um, um, several uprisings against the Huns were suppressed. And and uh, this shows that the, the these populations, uh, albeit that they were... Uh, they had been subdued. They 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 still had the strengths and the power and the political organization to to mount up um, uh, um, some uh, some some resistance against the invaders. And uh, after Attila's death, uh, the collapse of Hunnic power in the fifties of the fifth uh, century led to further violent upheaval in the lands north of the Danube during which the Ostrogoths expanded slowly southwards into the Balkans, right, and w then westwards into uh, Illyria and the borders of Italy. Um, so this is very interesting because it makes you understand that um, the, the Ostrogoths now that had been dwelling chiefly in the Ukraine have shifted uh, towards the west and occupying partly the same lands that the Visigoths had occupied, and reaching even westwards uh, into Illyria, into into towards the borders of Italy itself, 
right? Uh, their rule was marked by turmoil with hostile neighbors all around. Uh, and the land they acquired between uh, Vindobona, to today's Vienna, and Sirmium, today's uh, Shremska, Mitrovica, I believe it's pronounced, was not well managed. Um, so that even if the Hanek um, grip was, um, you know, losing itself, um, the Ostrogoths were falling unavoidably into the the, the Roman sphere now. Um, as to to rule these territories, they 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 required uh, necessary subsidies um, to Constantinople. And um, and um, and kind of entering into this uh, into this new this new sphere. Now, what is interesting about this is that the Ostrogothic expansion towards the west seems not really the one of a very compact people, right? Um, as we've seen, the Ostrogoths had never quite been uh, something like that. But at least in in the in the east, in the Ukraine, they had managed to create a sort of polity of sort. Uh, what emerges uh, after the collapse of the Hunnic Empire is a is a scattered people that that settles into areas that uh, now uh, somewhat seem to need the contact of the empire in this kind of more urbanized, sedentarized areas, possibly because the U uh, Hunnic wave had m compromised the possibility of developing another power of similar characters in into the Danubian uh, excuse me into the and the, to the southern Russian area um, also because um, uh, of course the, the, the all these movements of people ha had um, also caused important damages at the local level you know war there had been wars and devastations massacres so um, in terms of manpower in local resources, things that were, were running out. This is a phase in which, even within the empire, things are not going very well. Uh, also, the other Germ Germans that settled into the empire weren't like the, the terrible conquerors that arrived and they were so powerful they could overexpand. No, they had a very contained numbers. They had to be very careful about the word, what they were doing. They needed the support of the local aristocracies. And... Um, and they needed to make important choices at that point. But 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 what is important, in my opinion, to stress is um, how um, uh, you know diversive um, the the Hunnic model had been uh, for the for, for people just like the Ostrogoths that were under the Attila's yoke um, from from the Roman models. Right? Um, when we think about the Visigoths, we can't legitimately talk at, at one point of substantially Romanized peoples. When you talk about the Ostrogoths, at this point, well, it, it's mostly at this point that they start um, Romanizing in the sense of belonging to the empire. Like, you can't talk about the, or, or, or sharing the empire, or fitting into the empire in, in some way. When you talk about the 3rd, 4th century kingdom on the, the Dnieper and the Estra, uh, the Nestra uh, rivers, we're talking about Something that Romanizes chiefly in terms of material culture, of sedentarization, of wealth, uh, because the single next universal power that is there is obviously Rome. So every everything from uh, you know from from Ireland to to the Urals, uh, from, from 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 Ethiopia to Scandinavia gravitated unavoidably around Rome. There were no other opportunities of sort. Who believes that I don't know? Far in the north, peoples didn't know what Rome was. They didn't care. But that's a, a very sound a historical misunderstanding. Literally everything gravitated around Rome. The point that those peoples knew more about Rome actually than what Rome knew about them. Um, and this was important because it was a matter of opportunity, right? We have seen how the Germans had um, that the, the you the young Germanic warriors that had uh, the the most uh, one of the, their greatest interests was to become Roman soldiers to go out there to to go into this massive empire that paid them money to serve, and the the, the, the were used as contractors on a regular base and 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 when they were they they ended their service that they went back to to whatever they came from we we actually he have evidence of people coming from Denmark who spent their life in the Roman army came when they were discharged that they came back to there to their homeland and 
and they were proud to be Germanic warriors, but to have served as Roman soldiers, because that was the mindset. This was the idea. Never think that, um, in the, this people didn't were kind of an, an alternative. Um, uh, they, they had an alternative vision vision of the world of the universe compared to Rome. They, they could have different political and alternative political um, thinking. But the concept that the divinity of war, that was the single most important one for, for all the peoples of the time, uh, was was from the side of Rome and that they had to participate to it in order to benefit and to prove themselves worthy in front of their eyes was, was a big deal. was really a big, big deal. And this is also what, what actually favored, in part, um, the same... Um, Romanization of these peoples in, in some measure, like in how it was possible uh, for Latin Germanic Europe and therefore for from great great part of a European medieval civilization to exist. Right, the the history of the migration here is at the end of the day a history of civilization uh, that uh, is expressed by the the successful integration of Romans and Germans. Um, this is very important, in my opinion. It's one of the greatest lessons th that uh, th that historical period teaches us, and and it's not to be given for granted, right? Uh, integration is not simple. It's not easy. It's not like okay, let's be together, let's be friends, let's love each other. It didn't pass through that. It passed through to very difficult moments. It passed through very uh, dramatic changes and. Um, of which the Hanuk invasions were probably the greatest catalyzer because they um, they 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 realize that the, these populations realized that at one point it was nothing but Rome that could present uh, a safe harbor when ask the Visigoths right when they were fleeing from from the Huns uh, because they they didn't want to be under their rule right um, with the Ostrogoths it's different so the the peoples that remained within the Hanuk rule. Um, uh, had a different idea of, of their power and their prestige, and and the gods, in, uh, the Ostrogoths especially, had this too. This idea of former grandeur, of this idea, they had been something back in the day. They had had their own kingdom, they had their, their own empire. We can say, ruling over our peoples. This is what we mean. We mean in here, and. This will be. Um, th this was seen also by the rest of Germans as as a big deal, and also for by the same Romans at one point. Just imagining here that the myth that these peoples didn't communicate, that communications um, didn't exist, that they didn't know what was happening, is, is pure pure garbage. Like it, it wasn't like that at all. Um, you can or even if you read the, the, the Germanic sagas, if you think about. Individuals like Theodoric, Dietrich von Berg, for example, if you think about Albovin, I mean, th these were things that were sung all over that world. Uh, there was the, 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 the very clear uh, historical memory that such peoples had existed. Think about Hans, think about Etzius in the Nibelungenlied. Um, uh, th that was the moment, and uh, what is extremely meaningful is that, that those peoples remembered the migration here, in fact, as the key moment. That was the moment of the hero, that uh, of the heroes. That was the moment of the glory, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the blo of bloodshed. You know, um, also this very dramatic, and if you want, uh, you know, kind of negative idea of also what what the existence of the warrior that that yeah slaughters a great deal of people that ending to to always to be killed in some of the most. Uh, uh, unworthy ways, right? Because fate is cunning, and these people knew that when they were emerged in, in that world. So, talking about the post Hunnic movements of the Ostrogoths. So, the Ostrogothic uh, recorded history begins with the Ostrogothic independence from the remains of the Hunnic Empire following the death of Attila in 453. Now you know that Attila's uh, empire basically vanished, uh, but uh, after his death, but still his sons managed to to maintain a certain cohesion in, in Central Europe, um, and certain Germanic peoples still remain alongside with them. But there is at one point um, uh, the uh, this this battle 
that we mentioned before, the Battle of Nedao, I think before I said um, 453, it's actually I think 454, um, and um, the Ostrogoths participated with the Hans' former vassals, the Japids, um, and under uh, the Japids, the Ostrogoths, also other other populations, uh, for example, like the the Heruli, the Ruji, that would also join the Ostrogoths later, the Shiri and the Swabi. That this was this name at this point. That yeah, they, they still existed in practice, but also we have difficulties to to understand clearly exactly all these groups were how they scattered, um, aside for the, the major nuclei of their of their power that defeated in fact the Hunnic forces in this battle. Uh, Ost Ostrogothic contribution to the battle's success was somewhat minimal, but we have this account uh, that is actually fr frankly quite interesting from Jordanus himself, who talks about the Goths using pikes, uh, right, in this battle. So that sometimes we think, oh, the, the, the Goths had pikes. It would, that would be a very interesting um, uh, topic for, for a video, actually. Um, but the important thing here is that this Germanic populations break free. Mm. Not all of them. For example, it seems that the Longobards, that as you know, I I I, I, I love so much because I made so many videos about them, um, um, still stuck together with with the Huns till the very end. At one point, um, that was very important also for for what the Longobards' attitude towards the empire would remain. But the Ostrogoths at this point they they're completely uh let's say um uh they they got their revenge in part um for what could mean at the time I mean their 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 kingdom was destroyed now there were these people that had to recollect let's say and to and decide what to do and as we were saying before the other natural op the the, the only natural option at that point would be uh, the empire. Like it's not that at this time the Ostrogoths were a a great power that they could start to to be a a continuation maybe of what they had been before or a successor to the Hunt. No, they they couldn't. At this point, they they preferred to, to stick to the empire to to carve their own place along the Roman borders and to to also to rebuild their own hierarchies that presumably had suffered um, during the Hunnic times, all these wars, also to think about the toll of blood that they had to pay for the Huns, I mean, fighting against the Romans. Uh, the Battle of Chablon, of course, as we were saying before, was the Battle of the Catalonian, Catalonian Plains had been a defeat, right? And demographic uh, factors here are important. A single battle can wipe out substantial part of your people, um, of your men, uh, for your fighting men, that are in part the bulk is, uh, still also your own demographic strength, so um, in uh, and, and fighting of uh, political military power, so it's not uh, a few. Um, so the Ostrogoths were settled by the Romans on lands in Pannonia, becoming federati of the uh, at this point of the Eastern Roman Empire, given that there was still the Western uh, standing. So, during great part of the latter half of the fifth century, the Ostrogoths played in southeastern Europe nearly the same part that the Western Goths, the Visigoths, played in 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 the century before. Right, they were objectively passing through the same places, Romania. Uh, the lower Danube, more or less, were the same places, um, and they, they were seen going to and from in every conceivable relation of friendship and enmity with the uh, Eastern Roman Empire. And probably this was due to the fact that they they didn't quite have a um, unique political direction. Like probably there were several powers, chieftains, uh, even if there was a monarchy now that was taking shape, as we will see. Um, and, um, and and this is a bit like, in fact, how the Visigoths had done before them, uh, too. Um, and unchallenged by the now dissipated power of the Huns, the Ostrogoths under Valamir were themselves 
powerful and absorbed elements from other smaller tribes, such as the Shiri, for example. And um, a dispute with the Eastern Roman Emperor at Constantinople caused Volamir to lead his Ostrogoths against him. Uh, with the barbarians at the gates, the uh, Eastern Roman Emperor Leo I agreed to pay them an annual subsidy of gold. Um, this mm, already shows you a pattern that actually was normal at the time. Like uh, the idea of paying gold uh, to barbarians was uh, the average form of mm, negotiation on the inter inter international arena. Like paying gold, first of all, means that you have it and you can't spend it, and it's not a few. And the the Romans were quite, uh, and the Germans actually were quite concerned. They wanted Roman gold, the one with ingots that were marked by the Roman, uh, the Roman mints, um, and 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 this was a way to keep them calm, to keep them at bay, and and the empire could afford it. This was still cheaper than having these guys ravaging your lands, so uh, this was a common um, policy that, that the empire had. Uh, enact towards these populations, and objectively, the Ostrogoths on the northern frontier of the Eastern Roman Empire were were, were not like a very um, uh, pleasant pleasant presence. We can't say um, so. That's where the the Romans start to um, also to try to to control their policy, to Romanize them, and to as we will see now to divert them. Uh, towards the west, like they had already done basically with the Visigoths. Um, so, in here we, we have to talk about this great figure of Theodoric the Great, that is considered, in fact, the greatest of all Ostrogothic rulers. Um, also, um, the, um, the, 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 the name uh, of Theodoric means, uh, in Gothic, literally, leader of the people. Right, um, in a in a also sense of prosperity, you know, Theod would be the people, Rick would means meaning powerful, but also prosper in this sense. Um, and Theodoric was um, um, the also known as the Amal because it belonged to the Amal dynasty, uh, in Latin known as Flavius Theodoricus, which was a, a normal name, uh, as Flavius mean, means blonde, so um, that was often um, uh, a title given, like a, of recognition given to, to the Germans, um, in, uh, in Greek um, known as Theodoricus. And he was king of the Ostrogoths between 471 to 526, his death, and, and in fact ruler of the independent Ostrogothic kingdom of Italy between 493 and 526. He also was regent of the Visigoths between 511 and 526, and a patrician of the Roman Empire. Right? Uh, he would rise to, to great power, um, in progressively, um, he um, he was born to Theodomir in or about 454. Um, so therefore, soon after the Battle of Nedao, so just think even about this generationally speaking. I mean, what it means to be Theodoric, to to be the son of an Ostrogothic king of the Amal dynasty, and to be born from this generation that um, that is probably required now a great a great deal because it's the generation that has to bring the Ostrogoths to the same power they had had before the Hanic um, times and in this sense restoring the the power of the gods blessed by the rising sun um, but I now in a completely different political context, right, with, with a completely different base of power that is also not so stable, um, with a now obliged relation and referentiality to the Roman Empire. Uh, the same Theodoric as a child uh, was sent at Constantinople as a diplomatic hostage, where, in, in, he, where he was carefully educated, 
right? Uh, this was very important. The Romans, as you know, since the times of uh, think about Ar Arminius, like that they used to uh, to educate the Germanic youth to to acquaint uh, them to the um, you know to ro Roman civilization, to the prestige. So all these no Germanic noblemen knew Rome pretty damn well, right? And they and, and this was a way, of course, for making these peoples understand what were the advantages and the benefits that the path of Romanization entailed. And this naturally was, um, you know, um, uh, a path for, for the elites, right? This was not about the the people as such. It, it was about, from the Roman side, to, to new, nurture a new um, elite of... Um, a new Germ a Romanized Germanic elite to um, to have new reference points within these peoples that otherwise were too unstable. So the Romans were automatically st um, strengthening the local elites so they could have that all these um, tribes could have a unique chief they could uh, that that could mm, r control all these pretty uh, troublesome groups so that they wouldn't be like running around devastating Roman territory but being all under the same guidance that could be controlled by Rome diplomatically speaking. Um, so it's not just divide et impera, right? Sometimes it's also strength and, um, and rule because um, especially in these times like the, the a big deal was really about mm, the, the predictability of this system uh, as damage that could be done, especially in these moments of economical demographic crisis, could be enormous potentially. So, uh, Rome was extremely careful about dealing with this this peoples. So, um, Theodoric knew Rome pretty well. So that's where he, the seeds of a great leader were sowed, because uh, Theodoric, as we said before, would build in Italy um, uh, an incredible uh, system in which basically Romans and Germans would govern together. The first in the civilian affair, the second in the military affairs, um, and creating uh, a great power that f eventually failed, but that had actually a great potential and could really change uh, the history of Europe had things gone in different ways. I personally think that uh, there was that the recipe was doomed uh, to to failure because um, of certain reasons we will explain in a while, uh, but not because of the enmity between Romans and Germans, but for other problems that are chiefly political and social, and also uh, and especially at an international level in, in general. So. Um, the early part of Theodoric's life was taken up with various disputes, intrigues, and wars with the Byzantine Empire, uh, in which he had as his rival Theodoric Strabo of the Thracian gods. Um, uh, Theodoric Strabo was a distant relative of Theodoric the Great and, and son of Triarius, uh, that was a Gothic nobleman and, and soldier. Um, and had, uh, in fact, already been... Um, he, he was actually a member of the Amali dynasty, but at least uh, by the Battle of Nedao, Triarius had withdrawn his support from Balamir, who was his relative and the king of the Ostrogoths. So there was already this um, competition, as you understand, within the same Amali dynasty that doesn't speak for, for much cohesion. There were several heads in this sense, and probably uh, the Romans uh, had... Yeah, had kind of strengthened these elites, as we just said, but they also probably um, tried not to make one excessive, uh, one one branch becoming too powerful than the other, right? So this older but lesser Theodoric seems to have been the chief and not the king uh, of the branch of the Ostrogoths that had settled uh, within the empire earlier, right? So it it was a, a kind of a lesser figure anyway, um, if both for the Romans and the, the Ostrogoths, but still powerful enough to create problems uh, uh, for uh, to Theodoric uh, in um, you know even within the the same Ostrogothic people. Um, Theodoric the Great um, 
as he is sometimes distinguished, um, was sometimes the friend, sometimes the enemy of the empire. So even in here, the, Rom the, the idea of the Romanization has to be set straight. I mean, of course, he was Romanized. He was educated in Constantinople. But this doesn't mean that the Ostrogoths as a people, um, and, and therefore and, and Theodoric as their ruler, felt that uh, the future of the Goths had to be necessarily within the empire, or at the site of the empire, or even like in, in symptony with the empire. Uh, these were Aryans still, right? And probably many of them still pagans. Um, it was normal, right? Especially among these populations that had been living across the, 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 the boundaries of the empire. Um, so it, it was a matter of, of, of opportunism largely and uh, in this way both the Gauls and the Romans knew how, things, how matters were. Uh, in in the case of friendship, um, Theodoric was clothed with various Roman titles and offices. We've seen um, the, the term patri the title patrician before, but also the one of consul. But in all cases alike, he remained the national Ostrogothic king first and most importantly, right? And 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 still think about this that that unlike figures like Clovis, that would be one of his major, um, we can't say rivals, more than enemies, as he also married, you know, there was a, um, a strong matrimonial policy between the Goths and the Franks, etc. Uh, Theodoric had still, at this point, not settled into Italy, as we will see now in a while. The, 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 the future of the Ostrogoths in this Danubian region was still to be determined. Because that was not a florid area of the empire at all. Um, it wasn't like the era where the Franks had settled. So at, at the point they could, um, and in a very distant area from the core of the Roman Empire, so that they, they could do ba basically whatever they want, making their their engineering, their, their uh, associating with with the local elites, even a kind of autonomistic sense and having, uh, and, and building something new. Um, Theodoric had to still give um, a full unity to his people, especially to find a new land where to settle and where to make them prosper. Uh, this was the great promise of the Ostrogoths, they probably strongly believed in. And as we all seen in, in a while, this opportunity was w was given to them when they were sent by the same Eastern, uh, at, at this point actually only Roman emperors because the West had been knocked out uh, in, by invading Italy. Um, so, um, in um, um, Theodoric, um, especially for his policy in Italy, uh, is known for his attainment of support from the Catholic Church. And on one occasion, he even helped resolve a disputed papal election. Now, here we enter into this other realm of the religious policy. This is very fascinating, because... Um, you know, we have just said the Ostrogoths were Aryans formally, at least their elites were Christian, uh, Aryan Christians. Um, the the empire was Catholic. Going into Italy, uh, Theodoric has to deal with the Pope, to whom he is very reverent. Um, Theodoric, the first thing he does when he sees this Ravenna, and he, he takes control of Italy, is to go to Rome and to render homage to the Roman Senate and to the Roman Pope, right? Um, he was very clever in this because he understood that the Italic elites, including the ecclesiastical ones and the Roman Pope, um, had definitely an interest to remain somewhat decentralized from Constantinople. They, of course, felt themselves Romans. They wanted to be part of the empire overall. They had all the interests of that. But exactly for this reason, he had to present himself as a... Roman ruler, so he had to be reverent both of uh, Romanity and Catholicism. Um, and this was an important um, political choice, right? Also, and especially for what this concerned, the, even the, the relation with his own sub Gothic subjects, right? Not just the local Itali Roman Italic ones. Um, this system kind of worked at the beginning. It was a great work of, of balance, 
right? Obviously, we mostly see the, the Roman side of the story because it's better documented, while the relation between Theodoric is, and his gods uh, are somewhat more blurry, but we can uh, s conceive them as well. Um, so, I think the important thing here is to um, highlight uh, the importance that Theodoric had as a substitute of the Roman imperial rule in Italy, as he was a federatus of Rome and ruling, um, as we've seen, on, on behalf of the Roman Emperor in Italy. But at the same time, looking at the papacy and uh, albeit being an Arian, understanding that by backing the Roman Pope, um, he could, uh, in, a, in a kind of a competitive way with the Archbishop, uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople, um, he could um, win uh, great parts of the local uh, uh, ecclesiastical elites, in spite of the even splitting that happened between Arians and Catholics of the various various bishoprics, um, in order to to mm, to to increase this uh, autonomy of the same Roman papacy that the Roman popes had started to uh, to claim against Constantinople, right? Uh, the, the the popes never liked. Constantinople. They they always felt they could be part of the empire, but they always felt the primacy of Rome that had been recognized uh, since ever basically by the same Roman emperors. And then now, the uh, the emperors in Constantinople, however, wanted to equate the Constantinopolitan one by uh, sub mm, subjugating, subduing the Roman papacy to the emperor, like just like it it had happened with the Patriarch of Constantinople, and the popes said. No, we, we don't want that. Um, this was very important because you can already see a kind of specifically Italic dimension here, this Italic region that is very important actually as a, as a, as a system on its own, right? Um, the, the shift towards the East um, did entail um, a change in, in the nature of the Roman Empire um, in, in, in many ways, especially I mean, politically and, and culturally, um, and, and 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 Italy that at this point had never had hadn't gone destroyed. I mean, it essentially had remained um, a, a solid entity on in in its own regard in terms of I mean Roman structures, um, political bodies. Um, you know, think about the great Latifundia, the infrastructure. I mean, Italy, yeah, had lost the centrality of the Roman Empire, of course, but st it still was kind of something on its own. The Latin uh, aristocracy uh, in, in Italy was very, very um, uh, proud of its role. They they felt, and largely legitimately, as also culturally uh, the, the heirs of the ancient... Um, a Roman um, senatorial elite that in Constantinople instead had been uh, um, um, built as a mix of um, you know a, a bit of yeah aristocrats but also newcomers um, all peoples that were fundamentally co-opted by um, by the emperor in its personal policy so to, to control better society so these two systems were experiencing already um, a sort of enmity. Right, and the Gothic War would prove this. The Longobard invasion would prove this in many ways, because the Italic populations weren't very happy, especially the ones in the Apennines and in the north, um, to to be part of the empire. And in, in a in a certain sense, they they preferred to embrace the Germanic model, right? Whereas the the coastal and southern areas would mm, feel more convenient um, to. Um, to to stick like also for chiefly for commercial interest to, to to the to the empire, whereas the 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 peasant communities of the interland like feeling the the heavy Byzantine taxation etc would prefer sometimes to abandon the, the Roman territory to go leave in two territories like the Longobard one, so the Gothic um, rule in Italy has um, a great significance that 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 has to be understood for the same. Uh, 
patterns in which the, 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 the reconquest of Italy also evolved and how the, the resistance of the gods proceeded because um, this is not just uh, like the Romans were reconquering a land occupied by barbarians. No, no it, it's not simple as that. Um, uh, Ostrogothic Italy had a great uh, importance on its own. It was the center of a of a world between Europe and the Mediterranean that lots of peoples were looking at with great hope, right? Especially those central um, um, European populations that were either Aryan or Pagan that were quite worried about what was happening in, in the Frankish West and in the Byzantine East. They didn't want to fall into this all-swallowing uh, empires and, and looked at the gods from uh, Italy and, and Spain as, uh, as an axis that they could rely on to counter that um, that invasion and 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 and, and, and uh, that expansion, excuse me, and 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 this would, in many ways, at several levels, the regional, provincial, local level, survive as a tendency, and that would evolve, in fact, even into the same evolution and uh, um, the same transformation of of the West um, into something different. Eventually, it was the Franks that kind of took over this uh, area completely and would unifying the 8th century, the struggle against the kind of the eastern part, at that point the unity of the empire would be, compro you know, at least the seeds for the final um, uh, compromising of, of, of the unity of the empire were sold. Um, it, it, these are interesting things we, we could spend hours discussing, but maybe today we, we don't have the time talking specifically about the gods, but this is the point. Never see this as the passive thing like Romans versus German. No. Uh, see this, in, especially at the regional scale level. Think about what all these powers meant uh, for themselves, for the local populations, for their neighbors, and, and what all this major balance in the Roman Empire. I made many videos about this, actually. If you go in the migration era, I, I discussed this thing at length. Um, even when I talk about the Justinian's reconquest, they emerge um, quite often. Um, so uh, it's also very important, especially what for for what concerns the strictly Germanic perspective, uh, that Theodoric was an Aryan, right? Uh, and yet he allowed freedom of religion in Italy, which had not been done before. This is very, very important. Um, this didn't quite end completely well, and now we, we will explain why. It was not much of a religious problem, but again a political problem, and also a social one. Um, basically, all the other peoples, inclu uh, Germanic peoples, including the, the, uh, the Visigoths, had converted to Arianism. The only exception being the Franks, that as we've seen, passed from paganism straight into ca Catholicism. Um, and that was a hell of a clever move from Clovis, but he, he could that also because of specific um, conditions that he was extremely, extremely clever. Like, Clovis is amazing for, to, to understand. Um, and, um, and, and this had caused problems to all these Aryan populations, right? These were all Germans, as we've seen. We're talking about the Burgundians, about the Vandals, about the Goths. They were all Aryans. Uh, even the Longobards later would be Aryan. Um, and um, their, uh, th the problem was that they were substantially um, uh, not more than 100,000 Germans in, in the largest of cases. Um, like the Ostrogoths were um, ruling over millions of Catholic Romans. Um, as you understand, from a demographical point of view, there is not much of a chance there um, to to solve the matter. Uh, these populations, the Germanic populations, when they occupy um, the, um, the the local lands, they they of course begin theoretically as conquerors but very soon they are absorbed by the local population they start living like them they start speaking with them they start marrying with them right um and they start knowing much they start writing um some had the the time to do this like if you look at the history of the burgundians or the or the Visigoths, even of the Vandals, you, you can see that. The Goths remained 
uh, in Italy essentially for two generations. Um, they didn't have um, the time to fulfill that, but as all those other uh, Germanic, um, Romano-Germanic kingdoms, they would probably have transitioned, of course, into Catholicism as well. Uh, that's the most intelligent thing to do. You know, why do you have to, um, you know, to, to, to rule a territory where do you have basically all the population that is Catholic from a long time, or at least the major elites in the cities where all these Germans were ruling from, because that's what the, the, the territories of the empire were, that are Catholic, that are powerful, they have their their land, etc. You, 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 yeah, there, there, there is the hospitalitas, but that doesn't uh, that entails the, the confiscation of one, or just one third of the lands, like the other two thirds remaining to the Romans. So, uh, all these kingdoms had troubles at remaining Aryans for a while, and eventually they they converted to Catholicism. Now, what was the deal? What they would remain? Um, Aryan for a long time as ruling class. Well, because the, the Germans essentially recognized that as long as they they uh, 